Grazie a voi e questa sera vi parlerò della nostra guerra. Thank you very much to all of you. This evening I will be talking about our battle, our war. The war which we've been waging at the oncology department and I will be referring to one of the best known battles. Troy. Let us start uh, with uh, a, the foundations of the problems. What is a cancer? What is a tumor? You all know that it is the outcome of a single cell that transforms and slowly it starts growing and it forms initially a very small mass. Subsequently, this mass grows and it is first uh, contained in one site, but then subsequently it starts to spread, and it spreads to all other sites of the body. What weapons do we have uh, to wage this war? Well, first of all, when it is very small, when it is uh, not perceivable, uh, say, uh, with a PET, with a weak, there's not much that we can do. But when it starts becoming a bit bigger, then we manage, and when it is contained in one side, we manage to either remove it surgically or treat it uh, with radiotherapy. The point is uh, that uh, when we move on to another situation, that is to say where there are cells that are disseminated or migrated, then you also have to have a systemic approach. What we do is then that we treat the patient with chemotherapy. In other words, so we give substances uh, or administer substances uh, that circulate in the whole body. And uh, we fight the alteration of the cells. What happens normally? Normally there are cycles on the whole with a first cycle which is based with, on the administration of one or more drugs. You then may or have the possibility to reduce the number of cancer cells. With a second cell, you then reduce them even further. And in the best of all outcomes, with the umpteenth cycle, you have the disappearance of all the cancer cells. What I have just said is the optimal or best possible solution, but it's not always the the outcome. There are a number of steps which we have to bear in mind. Current drugs, or currently available drugs, are killers that kill both the cancer cells but also the healthy ones, which means that if on the one hand they remove the cells that are tumoral, they also have an impact on liver, bone marrow, and the like, and other organs, which are, which is the reason why you have negative side effects of chemotherapy. However, the other problem is that patients do not, are not always sensitive to chemotherapy. In fact, sometimes, uh, with the first cycle, you do not get a reduction in the number of cells, and that with the second one, you don't have a reduction either, and that in spite of the fact that you continue with three, four, five cycles, you don't, you're not able to control the cells, and they continue to disseminate throughout the body, or to grow throughout the body. Now, why does this happen? This happens because uh, the tumor or cancer is uh, not sensitive. In some cases, uh, the cancer can be characterized uh, by a, an inherent resistance. So that is to say that the cancer has some genetic features uh, that mean that it will not respond to chemotherapy. Very often, though, it is uh, the chemotherapy itself uh, which induces uh, clones, uh, that is to say, groups of cells uh, that are totally insensitive. 
What happens in this case? Well, with the first cycle, we kill, say, a certain number, certain percentage of cells, uh, which are the ones uh, that are more susceptible. But we do not or kill a small percentage of cells uh, uh, that contain genetic mutations uh, whereby they are not sensitive um, to the drug. When we then administer a second cycle and then a third cycle, we continue to remove uh, most uh, of the cells uh, that are sensitive, but we fail to remove that small percentage of cells uh, uh, which uh, are resistant. The latter are very few, but they can duplicate. Uh, so this means that you have clones, i.e. Uh, groups of daughter cells that progressively have or develop a, a stronger level of insensibility. That means they do not react. When, after a while, a clone reforms, uh, that is to say, when you have um, a recurrence of the cancer, the, such recurrence uh, means that the cells uh, are mostly not going to react to chemotherapy. Just to give you some percentages. At diagnosis, if we see here hematolog hematological or blood tumors like leukemias and solid tumors, for example, breast, lung, colon, the percentage of cancers where the chemotherapy is not effective is around around about 10%. When you have a recurrence, the percentage increases and it is between 80 and 100%. And if we wish to add something which is rather negative to a rather bleak picture, even if the cancer is exposed to one drug, very often it develops um, a number of strategies and multi-drug resistance. So this means that it is resistant uh, uh, to several drugs. It's also known as MDR. Now you all understand that this is a major problem. But at the same time, for a person who is specializing in genetics or biology or chemotherapy, it's also a challenge and it is an opportunity because if one manages to develop strategies to fight MDR, we will be able not only to improve reaction or sensitivity towards one drug, but to more than one drug. Now, what can we do? Traditionally, in oncology, but also in many other fields, there are two philosophies. One, which we might call, if we want to refer to the title of the conference, uh, of Achilles' way. Achilles uh, uh, was uh, a warrior who uh, fought with his sword and used his strength. And according to the recent uh, movie Troy, he also used uh, uh, weapons uh, that weren't really available at the time of the Battle of Troy. Now, what does it mean you to fight using strength? It means in this case that you would be using a high dose chemotherapy and also to uh, be administering a number of cocktails, which are, as I say, given to the patient. However, this approach does not eliminate the problem of being able to select cells uh, which in any case uh, uh, have a degree of insensitivity towards a number of drugs or resist uh, multi-drug resistance. And in any case, uh, 
It causes so many problems that in you end up by killing the patient uh, uh, through the treatment and side effects uh, uh, rather than allowing the cancer to do so or the alterations, the tumors to do so. Uh, what can we do? There is another solution, which is Ulysses' way. Ulysses uh, was uh, a, a less showy warrior. He meditated. What did he do? He thought, he thought it took him quite a while, because the uh, war of Troy was not a fast war, but he underst understood that to win, you must identify, first of all, the weak points of the enemy, and then you must also identify what the enemy's strong points are. Secondly, you have to be able uh, to prevent uh, counteroffensives. Now, in the case of Troy, the strong points uh, were the walls of the city, because the walls of the city were very, very thick. It was impossible to take uh, the city by assault. The Greeks tried, uh, tried, and tried again. However, they failed every time. That notwithstanding, Troy also had uh, some gates. So the simplest thing would have been to go through the gates. However, it was unthinkable that the Trojans would open the gates. So what you had to do was to sidetrack these gates or to bypass them. And uh, hence the story that you're all aware of, and that is to say that they simulated a departure and also apparently to abandon a horse, uh, a gift uh, for the gods. Uh, this uh, horse was exchanged uh, as a gift. Um, it was brought by the Trojans uh, directly inside the city, going through the gates. You also uh, know and are aware of the fact uh, that uh, it was packed with Greek soldiers uh, who in the night, that night, they left the horse's uh, uh, belly and uh, took the city by surprise. So let us refer this now to cancer. What is the strong point of uh, tumor? In the image above, you can see a cell a mic in my, with the electron microscopy, and as we could, might see it with all its structures. It has a nucleus, it has um, the filaments, um, and also a membrane. The membrane is uh, that sort of lilac-y color. This, these are its strong points. But what we saw is that the membrane of a cancer cell, of a mul uh, multiple drug resistant cell, has a an amount of cholesterol that's about twice that of a healthy cell. Now, you are all associate cholesterol with fast food or with a compound that is uh, associated with a number of heart problems. That notwithstanding, every cell synthesizes a certain amount of uh, cholesterol which is physiologically very important. Now, if we look in more detail at the membrane, we see that there are a series of lipids that are called phospholipids and that are thus described head and two tails, but the tails are not straight. They uh, leave holes. Cholesterol goes in between these and creates a sort of uh, support. This means that 
It is a sort of armor of the structure of the cell. What happens in a cell of a uh, MDR tumor, uh, the multiple drug resistant tumor, is that there is an enormous amount of cholesterol. Each and every nook and cranny is filled with cholesterol. This generates a structure which is very rigid and which uh, stops the drugs entering the cell. That notwithstanding, one has the question, is it a point of strength or weakness? Could it not be used and exploited as a weak point? To answer this uh, problem, we must ask ourselves uh, how hungry a, uh, a tumor cell is. How much cholesterol does it want to, quote, eat? I'm a biochemist and I study the metabolic pathways of a cell that here I have simplified, which lead to the synthesis of metabolites, cholesterol, fats, and so forth. Biochemistry is one of the courses um, that most medical students hate. If any of you here uh, have attending, are attending or have attended a medical school or science courses, probably you hated what was here. This is a simplification, but I am not now going to give you details of it. But the pathway that leads to the synthesis of cholesterol is the that little segment there, which I've indicated in an arrow, by studying these pathways, what we saw is that the need for cholesterol, that a MDR tumor cell has is about twice the hunger, in inverted commas, of a healthy cell. This means that the tumor cell is greedy and wants to guzzle cholesterol. Part of this cholesterol is um, uh, synthesized by the cell itself, but it really can't uh, um, synthesize enough, so it has to steal it from elsewhere. So what can we do to get the cell to think that it's eating cholesterol and, in fact, uh, putting a drug in it? We have to find a good gate or door. Now, going back to the membrane, we see that as well as uh, the fat component, there are also a number of uh, proteins. These include some structures uh, that uh, are outside or beyond the surface of the cell and that can capture what is outside the cell. They're gates, in other words, they're entries. And there are two main gates uh, that um, in fact, bring cholesterol into the cell. The first one is the receptor of the LDL cholesterol. Then there is a family of scavenger receptors that, in fact, bring a bit of everything in. Let's see what happens in any cell. Cholesterol, which is carried by LDL cells that are mainly used to carry this compound to the other cells interacts with the receptor of LDL and it is then the one which will carry the cholesterol inside. You all associate LDL cholesterol to bad cholesterol and I must say that when there are situations of uh, hypercholesteremia as well as uh, the LDL receptor. We have uh, a large number of um, scavenger receptors. Uh, they are the ones uh, which um, input a large amount uh, of LDL cholesterol in the cell, uh, which means that the, the cholesterol 
is uh, then filling the cell itself. The situation that you have in the case of cancer cells is not exactly the one I've described. In fact, the tumor cell has a large number of LDL receptors. And in fact, it does not have uh, scavenger receptors in excess. But usually, it has three times or threefold the LDL receptors as compared to a healthy cell. So, if uh, it is possible for us to give a brief description, we now know that uh, the multiple drug resistant cell is a cholesterol hungry cell and it has lots of gates, uh, i.e., it has a lot of LDL receptors. Uh, uh, but um, we could. Uh, mask or hide something else uh, or disguise it uh, as cholesterol. If instead of this we also were to put a drug on the LDL cholesterol, we might carry a drug inside the cell and this means that the drug would be dressed up, so to speak, as uh, LDL and would act as a Trojan host. host. So if we combine the tro War of Troy and Scandinavian sense of humor, we started building our own Trojan host. Now, there's a drug. The drug is surrounded by cholesterol. It is coated by uh, with a series of particles that directly send the structure on the LDLR, which is very abundant or plentiful in cells that are multidrug resistant tumor cells. Now, let us move on to see how you, what they look like with microscopies. Now, imagine that all live cells are blue and all the dead cells are red. If we administer a chemotherapic drug to a multiple drug resistant cells, all the cells are alive, they're all blue. But when we administer the same drug to a cancer which is not resistant, then all the cells look as if they're red, dead, 100%. Now, if we take the resistant tumor and we administer a Trojan horse, that is to say a particle cholesterol which will carry the drug and which will be taken to be cholesterol, this is the result. We have a partial cell death. You see some are blue, but some are red, and some are sort of purpley. This indicates that we have obtained a chemosensitivity, and we're quite pleased with this result because we've identified one of the points of strength and what we managed and how we managed to bypass the gate. That is to say, we have introduced the drug in a cell and we've managed to do this while we previously would not have had the same concentration. However, we must also be able to fight the way that the cell counteracts this. We must avoid the fact that once the army has entered the city, we must see that it should not be thrown out through the same door or the same gate which it came in through. This means that you have to avoid the fact that the cell should expel the drug that was placed into it or carried into it. Once again, let's go back to 
the channels on the surface of the cell. There are some channels that are the ones which are used to expel certain substances from inside the cell to the outside. In the case of chemotherapy, this refers to, in particular, to glycoprotein P, which absorbs the drug within the cell and it binds it and then expels it. This means that the drug is no longer able to accumulate, reaching a concentration able uh, to cause toxic damage to the cell and cell death. Now, if we look at the amount of glycoprotein P which is present in a drug-resistant tumor, we can see that there are many more glycoproteins P uh, in such cells compared to a healthy one. The speed at which, or the rate at which you expel the drug is much higher in a, a multi-drug-resistant tumor than in a healthy cell. So at this point, we have to, in our multi-pronged approach, we have to see that the cell should not expel the drug. We have to close the door. Going back again to the siege of Troy, you know that not all the Trojans died in the siege of the city and not all were killed. For example, Aeneas, uh, carrying his father and his uh, small son, uh, managed to flee the city. And his wife, uh, Crusa, uh, was uh, following uh, shortly behind, but unfortunately, the gate of the city was closed. She remained inside the city and died. We must do exactly the same thing. That is to say, we have to close the gates. What can we do? Well, ever since glycoprotein B was discovered, that is to say the 1970s, uh, we have, um, or the industry has produced and research has produced uh, a large number of inhibitors, but uh, no one has been successful in blocking it because of high toxicity and low specificity. We certainly don't think that we will find the compound that will block uh, uh, the glycoprotein P. But um, what I can tell you is what we have been working on as a team in Turin. You all are aware of the beauty of our city. For, we have the Po, the hills, but you're also know that 360 days a year we have a sort of mist or smog uh, that covers the city. Inside smog, uh, there is a family of compounds uh, that uh, are very particular. One of these is a very small molecule that is called NO, and uh, uh, which uh, has uh, very particular properties. It's a Janus, uh, which is not only two-faced, but multi-faced. It's associated uh, with all the compounds, uh, uh, in smog, but it's also associated uh, uh, to a discovery of a Turinese chemist, uh, Sobrero, who, passing uh, some notes uh, to a Scandinavian colleague, uh, made it possible for the latter to earn uh, a lot of money by developing dynamite. At the same time, we know that, moving on now to the health um, arena, we know that uh, it is the basis of the nitrovasodilator drugs, uh, which can be administered in the case of angina. NO is also a neurotransmitter between and among synapses. Um, and now to talk about uh, tumors, if it is administered in very high doses, uh, it is uh, a cytotoxic compound. 
Here you see a lung carcinoma. Each one of the purple little dots is a cell. When we administer the nitrogen monoxide in high doses after 48 hours, we have a decline, a marked decline in the percentage of these cells. Furthermore, uh, carbon, uh, sorry, uh, nitrogen monoxide is a modulator of the transport of drugs or drugs carrying on the basis of data uh, that indicated how NO could be a modulator of a number of proteins that help to expel a number of compounds. What we saw is that if we administer a compound able to release NO to a cell, which is characterized by multi-drug resistance, or therefore resistance to chemotherapy, and which therefore it expels um, the um, drug, we have a decline, in fact a very, very marked decline of the speed with which the drug is carried. Why does this happen? Without now giving you the details, the technical details, uh, here we've seen that uh, NO, in fact, uh, is a is attached or goes to get attached to residues which are essentially uh, which are essential for the way in which glycoprotein P operates and causes therefore a block how much however uh, strong and however often the drug tries to get through it remains trapped within the cell however since I mentioned uh, that NO has a series uh, of very marked effects, uh, it's unthinkable to administer it systemically to a patient. Uh, one has to target it uh, or carry it directly to the tumor or cancer so that uh, you can concentrate the effects exclusively on the cell of the cancer. Now, what can you do? Now, let's go back to our Trojan horse and let us imagine that each and every warrior that was inside the Trojan horse is carrying NO on his shield. Now, what we did in cooperation with the Department of Science and Technology of Drugs of our university is that um, we produced uh, a series of drugs uh, uh, which are conjugated or put together with the groups uh, that will release NO. We package them inside uh, the cholesterol and we covered them with particles that would carry it directly to the re LDLR receptor LDLR, that is to say the LDL receptor. Now, if we go back to the picture, we remember that the live cells are blue and the dead ones are red. When we administer that, um, that enhanced uh, Trojan horse uh, uh, to a tumor that was uh, resistant to drug and which meant that it was entirely blue, we obtain a picture such as this one. That is to say, all the cells uh, are red. This means that there's 100% cell death. Certainly, we can get and guess what has happened. Thanks to our Trojan horse, we managed uh, to selectively target and carry uh, the drug to the cell, and this is exchange. This is taken for something else. That is to say, for cholesterol. Now, this drug which is conjugated with NO and which is, uh, mas which is masquerading as uh, LDL cholesterol enters uh, uh, through the LDL receptor. Now, once it's inside, we have um, it breaking down. The cholesterol and the, part the LDL particles uh, are destroyed. We will therefore have at the same time a release of NO and of the drug. NO will block 
the structures through which the drug would have been thrown out or expelled from the cell. The result or outcome is that the cell becomes a bit like a drug-filled container and which is extremely toxic for the cancer. You see that we've now understood what the strong and weak points are and we have been able to avoid the counteroffensive. We're very pleased. But for the meantime, these are only studies on samples from patients or specimens. Currently, we studies in vivo are being carried out on mice, and if results are promising, the hope is to then start testing patients in a few years. This would mean that a situation such as this, where there is a widespread dissemination of cancer to a picture where at least we would have a drastic reduction of uh, the dissemination and there would only be cancer in one site. This, might, uh, this would mean that we could then remove uh, the small mass uh, surgically or with uh, radiotherapy. And uh, in the erosiest of all outcomes, if uh, we find it uh, uh, that it result is successful, it means that the mass would disappear. Or, alternatively, it could become so small that it can be removed or by our own immune system. However, one of our predecessors about 2,500 years ago, and we, re we recall him in the Hippocratic Growth, uh, told us not to be too easy-peasy. We know that we're but at the beginning of a long route and the LDL receptor is certainly one of the targets, but it is not necessarily the best one, because while it is true that it is present on cells which are resistant to drugs, and therefore do not react to chemotherapy, it is also present in the low amounts on other cells. This means that we cannot yet say that, we, that our uh, solution has 100% selectivity. This is one of the reasons why we asked ourselves whether it was possible or not to identify other gates, other entries uh, to carry the targeted drug and deliver deliver it um, inside the cells, um, in particular uh, where the, uh, you have a uh, multiple drug resistant uh, uh, cancer. This is one of the reasons why uh, we have been introducing a technique that is called cell surface capturing. What do we do in this case? Uh, well, you use a marker called biotin, uh, which is in black here, and this uh, attacks itself selectively, attaches itself selectively to the proteins which are outside the cell. Subsequently, you extract them and you capture them with some specific biotin or biotin-specific capturers, which means that it carries only the proteins that were on the outside of the cell, which these are then detached and they're identified with an instrument that is called a Maldetov spectrometer. Now, this is how we identify which structures that are on the outside uh, of the cell and uh, we repeat this uh, for millions of cells, both healthy cells and tumor cells. In particular, we do it for tumors uh, that uh, have uh, multi-drug resistance. By doing this, uh, we can map uh, 
all the structures that are on the outside and which are in relief of the surface. So far, we have managed to study the colon cancer. And what we saw is that there are about 150 surface proteins that are the ones that are between 10 and 1,000 fold time more present on multiple drug resistant cancers. And they're not present in the same amount in healthy cells. One is our mentioned protein, aforementioned proteins, the one which carries the cholesterol, but there are another 149, which could be future targets for a selective treatment of the um, most strongly drug-resistant cells. And lastly, to look into the future, you all know that it is very important that as well as a treatment, and it should be the best possible one, one very important step is a very early diagnosis. Our Trojan horses might also be used in early diagnosis. For example, as I mentioned at the beginning, when the tumor is very, very small, it very often is not diagnosed if you're using PET or SPECT. Now, let us imagine that we are going to build another Trojan horse, the usual one with a drug, cholesterol, and then with conjugated with particles uh, that bind uh, the um, multi-drug resistant tumors uh, selectively, therefore, for each type of tumor, in particular for, as I said, for the multi-drug resistant ones. We then add amplifiers. They're sort of probes. They are the ones that will increase the signal or enhance uh, the uh, CT scan or PET uh, results. Uh, and let us imagine now that we're going to administer it to a patient. Uh, if this patient has no tumor, these uh, will particles will just be expelled. If this uh, patient has a tumor, even a very small one, and uh, a, in particular a multi-drug resistant to tumor, we will have uh, some of these particles uh, that will remain trapped in the mass of the tumor itself. Now, even though it's small, this will happen because of the amplifier. And because of this, it will be seen by PET or SPECT before it can be diagnosed with other instrument. And also, because of the fact that the amplifiers will remain trapped inside the very few cancer cells, they will also start to release the drug immediately within, they will deliver it inside the cell itself, even though they are very few and far apart. This means that it will be possible to have a diagnosis with a first cycle of chemotherapy at the same time, shifting from a situation where there is no diagnosis, which means that there is no possibility to uh, give the patient a treatment, to a situation where you have a zero time lag between diagnosis uh, and treatment. This means that we will be beating the cancer on time. With this, I would like to thank you all very much, and I would like to thank all those who worked on this and who developed our Work, Professors Bozia, Gigo, Pescarmona, 
who were the professors uh, who have been uh, working with me and have accompanied me and helped me right from when I was a university student and I hope will be working with me for a long time. I would like to thank three uh, collaborators of mine, Elvana Campia, Joanna Kopeka, Marta Pinzondaza, who uh, in fact generated most of the data. And I would also like to thank all of those uh, uh, who worked with us uh, to set up a research product such this one, you have to establish networks uh, uh, with the necessary expertise uh, ranging from physics to chemistry uh, to pharmacy. And therefore, um, I would like to say that we have contacts in different cities and different countries which have made it possible for us uh, to continue to develop uh, our research. I would also thank uh, sponsors because without them, we would not have been able to uh, do anything. And I would like to thank all of you for having listened to me this evening. And thank you very much, uh, Centro Thank you very much, Centro Thank you.